Alrighty, so it looks like 1130 on my watch. So good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining our presentation today on Let's Talk About Sleep, Sleep and Diabetes. My name is Alana and I work in community health at Baptist Health South Florida. This presentation is a webinar style. So if you have any questions, please use the chat box or the Q&A feature. And I'll be on the back end assisting with that. Baptist Health offers a variety of free virtual exercise classes and programs. And for our weekly schedule, you can visit our website at events.baptisthealth.net. And I put that website in the chat box for you. And with that being said, I would like to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Dalia Lorenzo. Welcome, Dr. Lorenzo. How are you? I'm doing fine. Hi, Alana. Hi. So yes, I'll hand it off to you now. Okay, so I'm a neurologist and also sleep specialist, and I wanted to speak to everyone today about uh, sleep and in particular um, the um, role of sleep in uh, diabetes. So most people are aware that, or most people feel that sleep is a passive process, just some downtime uh, in a 24 hour period, but actually Sleep is a very active process that is important for many of the, the, the restorative re restoration of many of the body functions and of the brain. So, you know, when we think about sleep, when uh, the, what we know about sleep is that uh, you go through different sta stages in sleep where you go through deeper and deeper um, uh, uh, stages of sleep. And those stages are uh, orchestrated in an architecture over the seven hour period that most people sleep. Okay, and uh, for example, at the beginning of that period of time, you're going through a slow wave sleep, which is very restorative for the brain. And then every 90 minutes, you go into a REM period, which is uh, associated with dream uh, dreams. And that uh, has some functions that are important with memory consolidation. Um, and that this cycle changes over the seven hour period. So later in the seven hour period, you're having more REM periods. So it's a very actually active process and there's a lot of important things that are going on. Um, you know, besides restoring brain function functions, sleep also uh, um, serves to modulate metabolic and endocrine systems and cardiovascular systems. We know that uh, during sleep, there's a decrease in the metabolic rate. There's also a change in the um, sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. Uh, so, you know, sleep is a very active process. So now, Let's talk about uh, sleep in diabetics, okay? Uh, so there, there are sleep disorders that can make the, the risk for diabetes higher. And there's also, in, in diabetics, they have a higher incidence of sleep disorders. So it's a two-way street, okay? When you think about, uh, for, for patients who have diabetes, they will have a higher incidence of things like, um, uh, uh, um, uh, sleep apnea, uh, they'll have higher incidence of uh, limb movements, uh, insomnia is, is, is in a high um, uh, incidence on, among diabetics. And there may be a lot of reasons for that. For example, diabetics do suffer from neuropathy, you know, which is the tingling, burning, numbing sensation that tends to uh, uh, affect their feet first, then eventually their hands. And, you know, it can cause quite a bit of pain um, and difficulty getting to sleep. Also, the neuropathy can predispose them to something called restless leg syndromes or periodic limb movements in sleep. So, you know, restless legs for whoever's not uh, familiar with that, it's, uh, it's a sleep disorder where, uh, you know, patients when they're trying to fall asleep, they have an uncomfortable sensation in their legs that is only relieved if they move their legs. So it, it tends to happen, it has a circadian uh, period and it tends to happen only when they're trying to fall asleep. Like in the morning hours, it doesn't bother them as much. I've had patients who describe restless legs as the sensation of Coca-Cola bubbling through their veins. It's, it's uncomfortable and it's only relieved when they move their legs and it's, but that's only temporary. So they have to keep moving their legs or sometimes they get up and pace around and, uh, you know, so obviously that would be very disruptive and, you know, it can be found um, more often in patients with neuropathy. Um, the other one is the periodic limb movements in sleep, which is when they're asleep, they'll kick around. And sometimes that is just enough to get you out of a deep sleep into a lighter sleep and disrupt that architecture of sleep that is 
so important to restore many of the body functions. Anything that kind of disrupts that, that, that uh, sleep architecture, the stages, um, uh, can, can, can have uh, negative effects on the, what, what should be the normal functions of sleep and restoring the uh, body systems. So uh, the other thing is that um, diabetics obviously can have episodes of low sugar or very high sugar. Um, and, you know, this can also uh, uh, cause sweats, anxiety, dehydration, and all of these things can impair your ability to, you know, the ability to sleep. Also, many diabetics will have uh, the need to urinate frequently, uh, the polyuria, and this can also be disruptive of the period of sleep. So, you know, diabetics also, there's a lot of obesity uh, amongst uh, diabetics, and obesity is something that predisposes to sleep apnea. So obstructive sleep apnea uh, is, is a, you know, it's a major um, uh, uh, contributor to uh, disruption of the sleep cycle, okay? So in obstructive sleep apnea, uh, there is obstruction in the airway. So basically when you fall asleep, your, your airway, the muscles around your airway, they relax. Like in, in everybody it happens, but in people with sleep apnea, there's so much uh, collapse of those muscles that um, the air doesn't get in. So that's the snoring that you hear is the turbulent air trying to get into the, uh, to the lungs. Um, and, but the problem is that of course, uh, there are times that the oxygen goes down because none of air is getting in. So a person who has sleep apnea will have repeat, re repeated episodes where the oxygen drops as these apneas are occurring. And, you know, the brain in order to keep you breathing may send a, a signal to, to open up that airway a little bit uh, and allow the, um, the, the, um, the air to get in. And this is extremely disruptive. Uh, to the sleep architecture. And of course, the brain exposed to low levels of oxygen chronically like that is not, not good. So anyways, that's obstructive sleep apnea. And it tends to happen more often in patients that are uh, obese, okay? And uh, usually you suspect sleep apnea when a patient snores, especially loud habitual snoring. Sometimes the bed partners will notice that there is uh, what we call witnessed apneas, where they seem to pause in their breathing. There's no breathing movements for a period of time. They may catch their breath after one of those. And um, so, so it has a lot of cardiovascular consequences, and it's something that can be found frequently among diabetics. <clears throat> So, and of course, you know, just to round it out, people with sleep apnea, because they spend the whole night struggling to breathe, they never really get into deep levels of sleep. So the next day, they may have spent 10 to 14 hours in bed if they want to, and they still don't feel refreshed. So they wake up, non-refreshing sleep. The next day, they, um, you know, falling asleep in front of the computer, the television, hopefully not driving, but, you know, so it's a, obstructive sleep apnea is, is a big problem but it can be solved. It's something that does have a solution. Um, it's treated with a uh, CPAP. Uh, it's a, it's, you know, basically what they do is it's having sleep apnea is like having a flat tire in the neck when you're asleep. And basically the CPAP machine is like a compressor that, you know, opens up the airway. It's a machine you use when you're asleep. So, so anyways, um, there's actually been uh, uh, studies that have looked more carefully at the link between obstructive sleep apnea and diabetes. And there, there, is, there is some evidence that the low oxygen that occurs with sleep apnea can actually damage um, some of the pancreatic islet cells, you know, the, the cells in the pancreas that are uh, responsible for insulin secretion. So, so there is some evidence that, that the obstructive sleep apnea can decrease the insulin sensitivity. That's you know, more recent research. Now, it's not clear if the CPAP actually helps that, but we know that CPAP treatment for obstructive sleep apnea is extremely beneficial in many other ways uh, for the cardiovascular risks and stroke risks. Sleep apnea is... Uh, a, a big risk factor for uh, uh, stroke amongst men, particularly. So anyways, sleep apnea is another one that's, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, a problem with uh, diabetics. 
Also, um, diabetics, when, when they get the neuropathy, meaning that their nerves are damaged by the diabetes, it can also damage the, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves and cause problems in those systems, sympathetic and parasympathetic. And those systems are very important for things like regulating the body temperature, the heart rate, response to pain, uh, breathing. So besides obstructions, diabetics have a higher uh, likelihood of, of having just another kind of breathing problem like central apnea where they just don't initiate a breath when they're asleep uh, or they breathe in an irregular fashion. It's called periodic breathing. So, so there, there are very definite um, uh, associations between sleep disorders and diabetes, but then let's look at it the other way, okay? There's also uh, definite associations with uh, risk for developing diabetes if you have certain sleep disorders, okay? So I'm thinking, uh, well, insomnia is a big one, but just let's say the amount of uh, hours you get in bed can also impart a lot of risk for diabetes that, you know, so there's been studies where they, they just kind of measure or kind of uh, determine how, how much time people spend in bed in general overall. And, it, you know, most people will spend about seven hours in bed and that's what they need to feel okay for the next day. But there's some people who are short sleepers that will get less than, you know, five to six hours. Uh, and then there are people who are long sleepers who tend to spend more than nine hours in bed. Um, and then of course, there's those people who by lifestyle choices decide, decide to keep an erratic schedule where they'll sleep in bursts here and there, or, you know, or, or become, or volitional uh, sleep deprivation. So now we, we, we have good epidemiologic studies that show that uh, short sleepers, long sleepers, or erratic sleepers, they do have a higher incidence for obesity, uh, type 2 diabetes. Um, and, and actually, then when you look at how, how much that predisposes you to diabetes, it predisposes you to diabetes as much as not being, you know, uh, someone who exercises, so inactivity. That's as bad as, as, as inactivity for risk for diabetes. So it's a significant um, uh, uh, risk factor for developing diabetes, okay? So, you know, this is a problem, right? Because in the modern times, we spend a lot of time, you know, in front of computers and, and uh, you know, there's a lot more sleep fragmentation because people are, are expected to be much more available 24 seven. And you know, th th this is a problem, um, this is a problem. So, you know, I think it was estimated in one of the studies I looked at that, you know, one third of adults actually have some sort of chronic uh, deprivation of sleep, either short sleeper, long sleeper, erratic sleeping, et cetera, okay? So, um, insomnia. Insomnia is a big um, uh, risk factor, okay? Actually, there was a paper that I found showing that uh, difficulty initiating sleep imparted a 55% increased risk of developing diabetes. We're talking about um, chronic insomnia, okay? Everyone will have times where they can't fall asleep, but we're talking about chronic, uh, you know, persistent insomnia, okay? Um, so so I, I, I want to just run, run it by you because there was a study that was done in 11 healthy men okay they took 11 healthy young men and for six days only they restricted them to only four hours of time in bed so they only had four hour opportunity to sleep by the end of the, the six days they um they then did studies on these men and they found that they were already starting to look like they had impaired glucose tolerance they weren't handling their their glucose well they had increased cortisol levels, which is, you know, a, a, a steroid, um, uh, and and their sympathetic activity was hyperactive. So they started to show changes that, you know, um, would suggest uh, some risk for diabetes. So you know, it doesn't it, it, the the effects are chronic, but they're robust. They start to happen almost immediately. Okay, so. 
there's also um, evidence that shows that when you you have sleep deprivation, it actually also changes the way a person um, experiences hunger. Uh, so for example, there's these um, uh, neuro hormones, uh, ghrelin, uh, orexin, and leptin. And all of these are um, uh, neuroendocrine substances that are involved in uh, telling the brain, hey, I'm hungry, or I'm full, or what have you. Um, so we know that when there's a sleep restriction, there is a change in the way these hormones are produced that actually um, um, uh, favors hunger. So people who are sleep deprived, and I mean, a lot of people know this just instinctively, when they don't you know, get a lot of sleep, they eat more. So, so And we see that there's a biological basis to it. So it's almost like a uh, uh, you know vicious cycle. Uh, so we also know that um, the quality of sleep uh, will can can affect the quality of glucose control among uh, uh, diabetics. So people who have poor sleep uh, quality, uh, it's been related. Uh, to how well they're able to control their sugars overall, okay? So, um, hang on a second. I just wanted to look something up here. I just wanted to then um, maybe make some uh, recommendations uh, in terms of sleep and uh, sleep among diabetics. So, so if I were diabetic, First thing I would want to know is if I have a sleep disorder that's going to make the problem worse, right? So you you want to identify any sleep disorders like the ones I described, obstructive sleep apnea. Remember, if you snore a habitual, loud habitual snoring, okay, witnessed apneas, daytime sleepiness, non-refreshing sleep, right there, that's telling you that you probably have some degree of, of, of sleep apnea. And if you can get that treated, that, that pays a lot of dividends in terms of overall health, cardiovascular risk, uh, stroke risk. So that's an important one. Other, the other sleep disorders that, that are relevant and important to, to be able to identify. Uh, restless leg syndrome, which can really impair insomnia. Insomnia, which of course nobody can miss because they know they're insomniac, but th there are ways to deal with insomnia. It's, it's a big topic, insomnia is a big topic. There are obviously, there are medicines that are helpful for insomnia, but there's also a lot of non-pharmacological uh, methods that can be helpful to treat chronic insomnia that have actually been shown if, if done correctly, they can be as good as a sleeping pill, you know, instead of having the, the liability of being you know, uh, um, uh, habituated to a, a sleeping pill. So sleep disorders, right? So sleep apnea, restless legs, periodic limb movements and in sleep insomnia, and then, you know, sleep restriction. So, so I would say that if I, let's say, if I'm a diabetic or have a risk for diabetes or have a family history of, of diabetes, definitely don't want to be restricting my sleep too much and kind of pushing the, um, the potential risk of developing diabetes, okay? Um, so I think you also have to be, uh, uh, so for example, for insomnia, right? There's, there's simple things that can be done, uh, to, to prevent insomnia that don't, uh, involve, um, uh, uh, sleeping pills, right? So you can avoid taking any caffeine after noon, right? Because caffeine is about an eight hour half-life. So you want to keep it before noon, because if not, it, it, it could disturb your ability to fall asleep, right? Um, we generally ask patients to have, you know, a standard wake up time and a standard bedtime and to spend, you know, the seven hours in bed. Um, you know, uh, lots of times patients will take naps during the day and that actually burns off the sleep debt so that when they get to uh, bedtime, they can't fall asleep and all of a sudden they have an insomnia problem that can get out of control. Uh, there are sleep hygiene measures that are very important uh, um, to promote sleep. For example, not having any bright screens in the bedroom, such as a TV, using the bedroom only for sleep, 
uh, instead of you know using it as an office or place to look at your computer, uh, so on and so forth. Um, it, you want to make sure that your phone is on a do not disturb uh, um, setting, so you don't know, have all these alerts going off and disturbing your your deep sleep. Um, you want to make sure that the room is dark, cool, the temperature is good, the mattress is comfortable. Um, and, you know, if you do have things like frequent urination at night, trying to minimize it, some, some people will keep a urinal or something uh, at bedside so they don't, they don't have to make a big trip to the bathroom or anything like that. So these, these are some things that, that can be helpful, but essentially um, for uh, diabetics, it's important to identify sleep disorders and get a, get a hold of them before they become just another uh, problem that exacerbates the diabetes. Um, uh, controlling the sugars is very important because as I mentioned, poor sugar control, whether it be high sugar or low sugar can also impair sleep. So that's um, uh, in a nutshell, some of the things that um, I thought would be useful uh, to know about sleep and uh, diabetes. Um, you know, it's, uh, I can go into details, but you know, I want to see if there's anyone who has uh, any questions. Thank you, Dr. Lorenzo. So yes, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat box or the Q&A feature, and um, we will go ahead and ask them. Um, so I do actually have two questions, I think, related to, to CPAP. So I, there was one question that was, my husband uses CPAP. He still falls asleep on the couch, but I notice he's sitting up and doesn't gas. Is there a benefit to an adjustable bed? Well, um, so CPAP is, is obviously the equipment um, um, is supposed to deliver an amount of pressure to the airway here. It basically the pressure to blow up the flat tire that should be adequate to control his events. Now, Sometimes patients with sleep apnea, they'll gain weight. If they gain more than 10, 15 pounds, the pressure that they used to use may not be enough. So if, if, if the patient is using CPAP and um, you still hear them snoring even with the equipment on, let's say, or you know, they're still waking up with uh, respiratory events or, or it's not working and they're still sleepy during you know, the uh, day, um, that's one possibility. Maybe the pressure is not enough. Also, for CPAP to be useful, uh, it has to be used for a certain number of hours. Um, you know, the more the better, but a minimum of four hours a night of good CPAP use. And usually these, these machines, they come with, um, you know, a chip that will monitor the compliance, but also gives you a lot of data about how well the respiratory events are being controlled. And they can give you good you know, readouts about how, how many apneas are still occurring, even when they have the equipment on. So, you know, the first thing is to figure out, number one, is the equipment uh, working and is, it, is the pressure sufficient? Is the patient using it for long enough? If all of those things are good and there's good CPAP usage long enough, then there may be another problem going on. So maybe they kick around in bed and that's what's uh, uh, disturbing the sleep or there, there are some patients with sleep apnea will, that will have what we call residual hypersomnia, which means even though they've used their CPAP well, um, the next day they're still sleepy to the point where they're having trouble functioning. Sometimes we'll use some medications to help them, you know, be more alert during the day. There are other sleep disorders that I haven't mentioned because they're not common, but there's one called narcolepsy um, where patients fall asleep uh, just, you know, uh, immediately or, uh, and, and at random times. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a whole nother sleep disorder that, that requires more testing. It's not common, but it's treated in a different way. Uh, so, so, you know, if all of these things are occurring correctly in terms of the obstructive sleep apnea, and there's still problems during the day, he may need more evaluation. Okay. And then um, would you recommend a sleep study? For would, I, would, would I recommend a sleep study? 
correct in that instance, like for somebody. Oh, in that instance. Well, and and I'm sorry, I actually didn't answer her question. So she she is correct that apneas are worse when you're laying flat on your back. Okay. Sometimes we will prescribe uh, non-supine sleep, so sleeping on your side. We actually used to tell patients to sew a tennis ball on the back of their pajamas so they wouldn't roll onto the back because the apneas we know are worse when patients are on their backs. Okay, so presumably uh, inclining the bed should help things, but in the end, remember that the problem is you know the obstruction at the throat. Okay, at the uh, you know in the uh, uh, airway. So, okay, and then the other, the other thing she asked was about uh, a sleep study. Again, um, you know, if, if the compliance data from the chip isn't giving the answer, meaning, oh, he's not using it um, effectively, uh, there's a lot of leak, the, the, the pressure's not getting to the throat to do the job, um, uh, then yeah, it, it may be that he needs more pressure or different modalities such as, a, you know, BiPAP or what have you. Um, so then, a sleep study would probably be uh, useful to reassess whether this, the, the equipment is working or if he needs more pressure or what have you. There are some devices that have like an automatic uh, titration feature where they'll titrate the pressure themselves, but that's not used in all patients because they're, you know, it depends on the patient's medical problems. There's some people who have bad pulmonary issues that you know it's 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 not a good idea just to put them on an auto uh machine you know without uh uh carefully titrating the pressure so anyways that gets a little more complicated that's where you know then uh, uh professional advice from the patient's sleep specialist is needed okay thank you and i actually while you were mentioning that i actually just put into the chat box for you guys um a website to our uh website that sleep it's baptisthealth.net uh, backslash sleep as well as a phone number in case you are interested in, in setting up a sleep study or getting more information as well about sleep in general so perfect thank you so much um i do have another question about cpap so it says does using cpap reduce the risk of heart attack or stroke oh absolutely we i mean this is i mean it wasn't the focus of this talk but let me tell you that sleep apnea um is a big risk factor for stroke amongst men in particular. It's as bad as having, let's say, high blood pressure or anything like that. And we know that, that uh, these apneas, these, these obstructions to breathing, they put a lot of stress on the heart, okay? Because every time you have an apnea, um, you know, your, your oxygen goes down. Of course, the heart is working against this lower oxygen, right? And then the brain, in order to keep you breathing, it sends you a shot of adrenaline, okay? The adrenaline, kind of opens up the airway a little bit for you, but it also hits the heart. So it hits the, so your, your heart gets these adrenaline shots while the oxygen's low. It's like a stress test. Um, and, and people who have sleep apnea, you know, they have events and it can be quite frequent. So for example, we accept that, you know, the average person that does not have a problem with sleep apnea can obstruct their breathing about five times in an hour. And we consider that normal. But people who have more than that, now they have different degrees of sleep apnea. You know, there are some patients that will have apneas 40 to 50 times in an hour. And so if you imagine one hour with 40 to 50 shots of adrenaline, then you can see what, what is going on. It is a, you know, it's like a race. It's, it's a, it's a, you know, and this happens night after night after night after night. And then we will see patients whose oxygen drops, okay, uh, quite a bit. So, so for example, when you know they put your little uh, saturation monitor on the finger and they tell you, oh, it's 98 to 100 percent or whatever, when you're awake, that's normal, okay. When you fall asleep, it goes down a little bit, maybe 90, 97, whatever. But in people with sleep apnea, it's not uncommon for it to go down into the 80s, sometimes 70s. Um, and you know, that kind of low oxygen does its damage over the years. Okay. We do know that people with sleep apnea, uh, later on show changes on their MRI that, that show that there's been some, uh, effect of the hypoxia, uh, of the low oxygen. Um, you know, there's even the suggestion that the, it's, uh, so sleep apnea is associated with, uh, um, uh, memory loss and dementia later on. So. So there are very definite effects and, and it, there has been big epidemiologic studies that have confirmed 
sleep apnea is a risk factor for stroke. The other thing that's very important is sleep apnea because of the strain it puts on the heart and the, you know, um, can also uh, increase the risk of having repetitive atrial fibrillation. So uh, atrial fibrillation is a cardiac arrhythmia uh, and uh, it is a very dangerous cardiac arrhythmia for development of large strokes. And we do know that um, uh, people with sleep apnea, you know, have more frequent uh, uh, bouts of sleep apnea and CPAP can make that better. So CPAP, people who have sleep apnea who use CPAP regularly actually have less risk of going into atrial fibrillation. Um, so yeah, there's a very big link between sleep apnea, cardiovascular and cerebrovascular health. That's great, it's very interesting actually. Perfect, um, and then I just got one more into the chat. Uh, the Q and A says, I had oral surgery consult and my airway is very narrow just standing. Can this affect diabetes? I already have a CPAP that I use. Uh, so the, so the airway is narrow. I mean, there's many ways the airway can be narrow. Okay. It can be narrow back in the back of the throat because you just made that way naturally. There are people who have, uh, a, a very narrow palate where they're, you know, the palate is very narrow and high. Uh, and there's actually some, um, uh, factors like people who have, uh, hypoplasia, the mid face, like some of the Asian people, a little flat in the face, they have higher risk for, for sleep apnea from the anatomic characteristics that they have. Okay. Now, whether or not um, the, the, the shape of the um, palate or the, the way the throat looks um, increases uh, diabetes is really secondary to if it causes a sleep um, uh, disorder, like I mentioned to you. So for example, if you have, let's say sleep apnea, because you have a uh, uh, crowding of the airway, then you're more likely to have fragmented sleep, which then, you know, as I mentioned before, can increase the risk for diabetes independently, independently from, let's say, you know, having a, a family history, being obese, being this or the other. So, so yeah, I mean, taken that way, if you do have, um, uh, you know, an anatomic characteristics that put you at risk for sleep apnea. Yeah, secondarily, it can increase your risk for diabetes. Okay, I, I hope I'm answering that question correctly. I mean, you know, what was being asked. Thank you. Yes, and if you if there is any follow up, you guys can just message again in the chat or the Q and A if, if it wasn't answered. But um, I don't see any other questions. I'm, I'm just searching again through the chat box to make sure I didn't miss anything. But while we're waiting for any last minute, I just want to thank you, Dr. Lorenzo, for this wonderful presentation. I learned a lot actually myself. And uh, yes, uh, and again, I, I put the resources into the chat already about, again, our, our link to our website, as well as the link to the website for sleep to give you guys more information. And is there anything else you'd like to leave us with before we end the session? No, I just hope everybody has good sleep. <laughs> I know, absolutely. <laughs> and thank you for inviting me, okay? Yes, thank you so much. So I don't see any other comments or questions, so I think we will go ahead and end the session. Thank you very much, Dr. Lanza. Thank you, everyone, for joining. My pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye.